After one of the world's most disastrous wars in the Pacific, the Philippines emerged as one of the highest GDP per capita income in East Asia. It was a country only behind Japan, and records showed that the Philippines also had one of the highest educational standards in the developing world. It was, after all, one of the only few nations that had privileged access to the world's largest economy through the colonial experience-led Laurel Langley Agreement, which expired in 1974. By the mid-1960s, there should have been zero issues that would limit its growth. It was largely away from its regional problems. Vietnam, for instance, was at war. Indonesia was campaigning against the newly formed Malaysia and further Malaysian Singaporean separate in 1965. Even though the Asian Development Bank had set up its headquarters around the capital region of the Philippines, implying that they were confident in the country's future. Yet, as the story of the Philippines goes, the country would be overtaken by several countries. Real GDP per capita was higher by almost every Asian nation. Yet, by the 1950s, both South Korea and Taiwan would overtake the Philippines, followed by Thailand in the 1970s, Indonesia in the 1980s, and China in the 1990s. This was arguably the most unfortunate turn of events in the 20th century for the Philippines. A country once hailed as only behind Japan and East Asia is now behind all of the East Asian nations. So what happened? Considerably and controversially, a lot. A lot of issues went on, in and around the country. Today, however, one of the most complex reasons for this case is oligarchs, a term defining the ultra-rich individuals who rule the country and use their power to leverage against any type of reform. This has been a long-standing case of the concept of the Philippines falling behind, an argument that asserts the highly unequal social structures of the country, and has impacted political processes to the point where serious policy reforms, especially if it challenges the oligarchs' vested interests, are impossible to be a established. One can understand just how bad oligarchy is way back in the 19th century when the country was being commercialized by powerhouses led by American, British, and Chinese traders who would lead the country's elites. Filipino Chinese especially was at work here. These groups of relatively anonymous landowners formed the primary social base for the First Republic of the Philippines, established in 1899. And when the United States began its conquest of the Philippines, it sought to win over these local powerful forces. The creation of the National Assembly in 1907 enabled provincial elites to consolidate their hold on the national state and creation of a solid, visible national oligarchy. The largest case of oligarchy that started to undermine the Philippine economy was when the Philippine National Bank between 1916 and 1921 would be plundered. Following these steps, the rich and powerful would win over political names and manipulate them by letting them acquire and obtain land, and have favorable access to raw resources that they can once again use to enrich themselves. And even only three years after its independence in 1949, the Philippine state nearly collapsed. Oligarchs plundered rehabilitation assistance to pay for themselves. In other words, as we will not dive deep into the very history of oligarchy, they were simply at best rotten to the core. Decades later, during the Ramos administration, he would initiate what is known as Philippines 2000, a rallying strategy that attacked cartels and monopolies. Years later, Ramos had even explained that the reason the Philippines lagged behind its East Asian peers was simply due to the political dominance of oligarch groups. With our initial statement, therefore, who else could we blame other than these oligarchs for the cause of the Philippines' economic failure? Unfortunately, even to this very day, oligarchs still exist. An article published by Strategic Culture Foundation even posted a dramatic post in May of 2022 titled The Philippines, Return of the Oligarchs. In prior years, a number of lawmakers have still cited the term oligarchs in many occurrences. One can doubt, however, that the oligarchs have all but disappeared. But in most cases, as long as the term still exists, several institutions still believe that they are there, and inequality persists. Oligarchs may then still be here. What is saddening, however, is also the fact that there have been few actions taken to stop this disaster. If anything that can be praised could be the opening of foreign ownership in the country. Back a few years ago, if you would remember, the top executive signed a law that would allow foreigners to open 100% equity in a certain asset. This will, of course, increase competition and decrease monopolistic activities. While it is a good step to take, it may not be the sole answer. Thinking about this further should be discussed in the very executive government. Yet from the looks of it, these are not being tackled seriously. But anyway, do let us know what you think. Where and what do you think the country or the government should fix its oligarch problem? Should the government finally implement policies to support the market? Or is it possible to think that crony capitalism has actually helped the country? Let us know down below. Thanks for watching.